Isaiah chapter 58 tonight in verse 13. Isaiah 58, 13. I want to speak to you for a little while on the subject delighting in the Sabbath. Delighting in the Sabbath. Isaiah 58, 13. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Remember in the first part of this chapter, the Lord speaks of fasting and what was wrong with the religious fasting that the Jews were doing, and then he describes his true fast. Well, here in these last two verses, by the way, that true fast was Christ and his gospel. Fasting, the whole point of fasting was self-denial. And in a spiritual sense, the way sinners deny themselves is by taking up their cross and following the Lord Jesus Christ. If any man deny himself and take up his cross. Now in these last two verses, the Lord speaks in the same way of the Sabbath. The true spiritual Sabbath, as opposed to just the religious observance that was going on. <clears throat> and still does. Turn away first, turn away thy foot from the Sabbath. Keep your foot out of it. You were not supposed to walk more than just a very short distance on the Sabbath, just out of necessity. You're supposed to not do any labor, no servile labor whatsoever on the Old Testament Sabbath, and there's a reason for that. <clears throat> what is the spiritual significance of not doing anything? That's the whole gospel, is you can't do anything. <clears throat> Christ is our rest because it is his walk before God that we look to that is our righteousness before God. Our walk is sinful. If we put our foot into it, we've ruined it. <clears throat> the truth of the matter is, spiritually, we're lame on both of our feet. We can't walk anyway. Why would you want to put a lame foot forward on the Sabbath day? That's pictured clearly, of course, by Mephibosheth. And uh, how that he was lame on both of his feet. And, but he was sitting at the king. The king sent and said, go get Mephibosheth. I'm going to feed him from now on. He's going to sit at my table. We're pictured by Mephibosheth, but Christ does for us all that needs to be done, as David did for Mephibosheth. David is Christ. He does it all. The next phrase in verse 13 is quit doing your pleasure on the Sabbath day. In other words, quit doing what pleases you. Religious people who don't know Christ, the true Christ of this Bible, are pleased with themselves. They're pleased with their religion. They fast their way, the first part of the chapter, and they keep the Sabbath their way. And they're well pleased with themselves. But remember what God says about man's self-righteous religion in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 13. He said, bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the Sabbaths. There was the Sabbath day and then there was the Sabbath feast. He said, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity. And the Sabbaths were included in all of that. The religion, the Christless religion of the Jews at that time, he said it's iniquity. Even the solemn meeting, 
When you get together and say, oh, look, we've come to church and we're worshiping God. He said, no, you're not. It's iniquity. It's sin. Because you're not looking to Christ. You're looking to your church going instead. And, and God, listen, God never points to what's wrong with you without pointing you to the Savior. God was sickened with their false, Christless, outward show religion and told them so. But what did he say then? Same chapter, Isaiah 1, verse 18, just a few verses down. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. What about, what is God? What's the issue? Your sin and how it can be put away. Not all of your religious activities. Their iniquity, their sin. <clears throat> What's important? How sin can be put away. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You come to Christ and, and you'll be made white as snow. Sins are made white as snow in the precious blood of God's Lamb. <clears throat> the answer to false religion is not better religion. The answer to everything is Christ. Now look at the next phrase in our text. Call the Sabbath a delight. Don't delight in your keeping of the Sabbath. Delight in the Sabbath himself. Himself. Don't take delight in what you do. Take delight in him who is the sinner's rest. He said, come to me and I will give you Sabbath. I will give you Shabbat. Rest. Remember what the Sabbath day is again. God rested. The first Sabbath was when God rested on the seventh day from creating the universe. He rested from his work of creation, not because he was tired, but because he finished it. It was complete. He said, it's good. And so he rested. The earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And then the Holy Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God made it beautiful and fruitful. And he himself said, it's good. That's salvation. In every respect, that's the salvation of a sinner in the Lord Jesus Christ. When he finished the work of salvation on Calvary, God said it's good when he finished the first creation. You know what the one who created all things said when he had finished salvation? It's perfect. It's finished. That word, it is finished. It means perfect. It's perfect without you. It's what he accomplished alone is perfect. Where's your footprint in the creation of the world? Where was your foot then? Well, then keep your foot out of the new creation in Christ, the salvation of your soul. You'd only mess it up. His perfect salvation can't be messed up. And do you know what happened after he said it's perfect? We're talking about the Sabbath now. You remember he said it's perfect. And you remember what happened then? He arose and ascended and sat down. <laughs> That's the Sabbath. Why did he sit down? Because he was tired? No, because salvation was done. The salvation of all for whom he shed his precious blood was accomplished. Sit down. No high priest in the Old Testament ever sat down on the job. There was no chair in the tabernacle because their work was never done. They had to offer sacrifices continually. But our high priest is described in Hebrews 10, 11, and every priest standing daily, standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Why in the world did they offer them then? To point to the one sacrifice that does. Listen, but this man... After he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down. It was Sabbath time. He is the Sabbath. He sat down <clears throat> on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. And here's why he sat down. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that he sanctified with that precious blood. So what the Lord God is saying in our text is don't delight yourself in anything that you do on a Sabbath or in your observance of a Sabbath. 
Look to Christ who is seated on the right hand of God and rest in him. Delight in him. He sits there having obtained eternal redemption for all those for whom he died. Can you delight in him alone? God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision. Your keeping of the law or not keeping of the law doesn't make any difference. But a new creature, not when it comes to salvation it don't now. And you better be glad it don't. If it does, you're a goner. Here's what does avail, a new creation. That's what we talked about, the old creation. God rested in the new one he did too. He accomplished it and he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. A new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, that all glory is unto him, peace on them. Peace on them. And mercy. And upon the Israel of God. Oh boy. So are you saying Chris. That Christ himself is the Sabbath. That's exactly what I'm saying. But more important than that. The reason I'm saying it is because God said it. Turn with me to Colossians 2.16. Colossians chapter 2. And verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days which are a shadow of things to come. Don't let anybody judge you on whether you're keeping the Sabbath or not keeping the Sabbath. Those were just shadows, but the body is of Christ. You see that word body there in verse 17? Those things were shadows. The Sabbath day is what we're talking about in particular. It was a shadow. But the body, the body, that word body there means what you think it does. It means the body of a man or an animal, either living or dead. But it also has another definition. Look it up. And see if you think maybe this is what Paul was talking about when he said the body there. It means this, that which casts a shadow as distinguished from the shadow itself. The Sabbath day was a shadow, but the one who cast the shadow, the substance of it, is Christ. Christ is the Sabbath. Both are true. God had a body. A body thou hast prepared for me, Christ said. That's true too. But also he is the one who is the embodiment of. Of all Old Testament types, pictures, ceremonies, he's the tabernacle, he's the high priest, he's the burnt offering, he's the mercy seat. He's all of those things. The difference is that he actually accomplished all that those things could only picture. They could only foreshadow them. He accomplished it all. He is our rest before God. The work of salvation is done by him and we rest in him. So glory in him. Not in the pictures. That's what our text is saying. Honor him. Delight yourself in him. Glory in him. Not in your observance of things that only point to him. The religious Jews thought they had salvation even in the scriptures and they were wrong. How could they, how could something so holy and perfect, they trusted in the scriptures and they were wrong? Yes, they were. Listen to it. The Lord Jesus Christ said in John 5, 39, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. They knew the scriptures pretty good. And so when he said you need to look again, that probably offended them as he always offended them. But listen, he said you need to look again because here's the truth. The scriptures are they which testify of me and you won't come to me that you might have life. The scriptures, all that they say is come to Christ and you won't do it. So you can trust the scriptures and be wrong. Not what the scriptures say, If you trust what they say, you'll trust Christ. But you will not come to me. They testify of me. What do you think he meant by that? You think you have eternal life in the scriptures. But I'm eternal. You won't come to me. The only way to have life is to come to me. What do you think he meant by that? Paul in Colossians 2.16 there, where we read, said, Don't let anybody judge you concerning a Sabbath. 
We're talking about the Sabbath, now delighting in the Sabbath. Don't let anybody say, oh, you're not supposed to do that on the Sabbath. You're not keeping the Sabbath day because you're not supposed to do that. Don't let anybody say that to you. Don't listen to them. They're delighting in their religious activity. They're not delighting in the Sabbath. They're delighting in their keeping of it or lack of activity. Listen, we, by God's grace, we delight in the sinner's true rest, the Lord Jesus Christ. When I was a kid, I'll be honest with you, church worship services were grueling to me. They were grueling. I'll be honest, they probably were to you too when you were a little kid. It was grueling. It was, it was, um, when church, I'll put it this way, when church was over, we were ready to go play football or something. We, that's all we ever did. If we weren't playing football, we were playing basketball in somebody's driveway. And that's all we did. There was no school. So if we weren't playing basketball in somebody's driveway, we were finding a field somewhere and playing some football. That's what we did. But nope, not on Sunday. Can't do that on Sunday. My mom said, nope, can't do it. I wasn't happy about that. Can't play football. Can't play football on Sunday. Think about that for a second. Do you think God is going to delight in you and accept you because you didn't play football on Sunday? You see how ridiculous people get about religious things, observances of of religion. God is pleased with his son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He's pleased with his son and all who are in his son because he's made unto us all that we need, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Our te- and listen, God is pleased with his son and what our text in Isaiah is saying is you'd better be too. Delight in him, honor him. You better delight yourself in Christ alone now. God forbid that I should glory in anything but Christ and what he accomplished on Calvary. Look at the last part of verse 13. Honor him. Honor him. And how do you do that? Remember now, honoring him means denying yourself. And that's the next three things in the verse there at the end of the verse. Not your ways. Not your ways. Not your pleasure. And not your words. Those are the three ways you honor him. Think on that for a while. Not your ways. God said, my ways are not your ways. Sinners are not saved your way. They're saved God's way. They're not saved by man's decision or free will. It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth or striveth, but it is of God that showeth mercy, salvations of the Lord. Not your ways, not your pleasure. Not what makes you happy. It's what makes God happy. It's not whether you accept him. It's whether he accepts you. And not your words, but his. What you do, what you want, and what you like, and by nature, and what you say. All of that is out the window now when you confess Christ. It's gone. None of that. Paul said, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, Philippians 3, but Christ in his righteousness. You renounce yourself. That's what our Lord was talking about when he said, taking up your cross. And following me. Crosses just ever served one purpose. There's only one thing a cross is good for. Or ever has been good for. People die on them. That's what our text is talking about. Not your ways. Not what you like. Or pleases you. And not what you say. We're dead to sin. And sin is what we are. It's not just what we do. We're dead and our life is hid with God in Christ Jesus. You renounce, people die on crosses now. And that's what our text, listen, Romans 6.10, for in that he died, he died unto sin once. He died having borne our sins, the sins of his elect and his body on the tree. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin but alive unto God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Because Christ Jesus died for me, the result of that is that whereas I was alive unto sin and dead to God, now I'm dead unto sin and alive unto God. That's what Christ accomplished for me on Calvary. That's what we picture when we're baptized. Christ is my life now. Now, verse 14, because of Christ, in Christ, verse 14, 
by God's grace, you don't glory in anything else now. You see the beginning of the verb, but him and what he did on Calvary. You, now you delight in yourself in the Lord. Remember now you delight in his perf- perfect salvation. Remember what Paul said. We've got to quote it again now. This, this verse has applied, I believe, in every message we've seen in this chapter in Isaiah. Listen to it again, though, to it, Philippians 3.3. 3. And see how this applies to our text. For we are the circumcision, that is, we are the covenant people of God. Circumcision was the outward sign of the covenant that God made with his people. All right, the Jews, the earthly Jews, but picturing the spiritual Israel of God from every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue under heaven. We are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit. It takes God's spirit to worship God. You can't worship him in the flesh. And rejoice in Christ Jesus. <laughs> He's not one of the things we rejoice in. We rejoice in him and have no confidence in this flesh. Not my ways, not my pleasure, not my words. Him. We rejoice, we delight ourselves in the Lord. And that next part there in the verse, when he talks about riding the high places, I'll cause you to ride the high places and feed you. If God feeds you, you're fed now. You know what that means? Just to boil it down, it means you're sitting pretty. (laughs) I don't know. I think I got that from my dad, that phrase. You're sitting pretty in Christ. You're riding on the high places of the earth. You have a completely different perspective on everything now. And you're fed by God himself. You're sitting at the king's table now, Mephibosheth. You're lame on both your feet. Don't even put your foot into it. (laughs) Just enjoy Christ and how he has done and is doing and shall do everything that needs to be done for you. That's me. Now listen, and, and the last part there, it can never be any other way because God said so. Isn't that glorious? If you told me that, I'd be too good to be true. But if God said it, it must be true. I could never believe it from anybody else. That I'm really sitting that pretty in Christ. I could never believe that. And by his grace alone, we believe it now. And you know what we say when the mouth of the Lord speaks? Amen. (laughs) That that old, that that woman of Canaan in Matthew 15 What did she say when the Lord spoke? Truth, Lord. He didn't say what she wanted to hear either. If the Lord calls you a dog like he did her, you know what you say? Truth, Lord. And if the Lord says this to you, this is my son. Honor him. Bow to him. Believe on him. Hear ye him. You know what you say? Yes, Lord. By his grace, may he make it so. Amen.